Hey guys, do you work in emergency medicine, an absolutely crazy and intense environment where you see things every day that a regular person doesn't see once in their entire life? Do you feel burned out, unappreciated, like there's no one you can talk to about the things you are struggling with? Well, you are not alone. I have a bunch of real professionals with real stories here with me today that can relate to your struggles. I've struggled with burnout, discouragement, and frustration many times and still struggle with it occasionally. My name's Aaron. I've been in emergency medicine for 15 years as an EMT, paramedic, and now emergency medicine PA, and I am the host of the Practical EMS podcast. We've got some new guests with us today and some returning, so we're going to jump right in and do some introductions and talk about some awesome topics today. I don't, like, I will very, very seldomly, like, drink because... I think everybody is susceptible to have becoming addicted to substances or whatever. And so, um, I have family history of it. I've seen it, like I've seen it in my personal life. I've seen it in patients and I want nothing to do with it. Like for myself, you know, being, being on the receiving end of those substance problems, the substance abuse problems and the other issues that it caused secondarily for myself, you know, and my family, that's why I don't do it. So, but I don't think that anybody is safe, if you will, from, from developing a dependence issue. And I think that the world makes it really easy, like you guys were saying to, for it to happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's why I don't do that. But um, we also learned a lot of like de-escalation and how to like gain a rapport with your psychiatric patients when I was going through school too. So I think it's starting to become more common practice, but definitely like when I first started, it was not that way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm glad that, that we're seeing that change because I think it's definitely needed. Yeah. And it's hard. Because sometimes they just push your buttons. You have yeah. to be willing to like stay on scene as long as possible. Like, I'm just, we're going to do this and it's going to be in a friendly manner. Mm-hmm. Sitting like, okay, you're, I'm going to be in this room for an hour and a half just to get you to stay in bed. Yes. Just to get you to sit down. And that's and that's what you want to do. Because you don't, like, no one's goal is to sit on, like, have eight people sitting on top of one. We don't, I, I personally don't like doing that. Right. You know, and so sitting and negotiating or talking with them and, are like, hey, you you are not necessarily like the goal here is we both have the same end goal here to get you out of here happy, safe, and healthy. And how the best way we're gonna do that. And then once they realize you're not the enemy, it's, it just takes you just have to be willing to take the time. Yeah. And it might just be hours. Yeah. I've definitely been the person that people hate. Oh, <laughs> I've been kicked out of rooms before. Oh yeah. But then I've also been the only one that that person wants to talk to. Oh yeah. You just it walk just in depends like your face, get out. No, no, no. Actually, oh, okay. <laughs> that literally happened to me. I was like, answer these questions and I'll leave. And they're like, fuck you, get out of my house. And I'm like, I'm out. I don't want to be here anymore anyway. <laughs> but it's like, who's who's gonna be the hero? I don't know. Anybody on your crew might they just be pick. It's usually always like the tall firefighter, and they're like, You, I'll listen to you. And I'm yeah. like, all right, I would have too, it's fine. I've had the exact opposite. They always want to fight them because they're the ones starting the fight. Oh, really? Yeah, which that's a whole nother oh, I can bitch about that. thing to do. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's a hard skill to develop, especially when you're a new EMT or new paramedic. You're so worried about all the skill stuff and am I doing the right medicine? Am I what's this drug dosage? And what if I gotta innovate somebody today? And like you're just trying to go through the motions and do a an entry level job. And then I think after you've done this for a few years, you start to realize like, oh yeah, I got into this to actually take care of patients and communicate with somebody. And that's when, at least for me, like I was, especially when I was a new PA, I was so focused on just doing the job. And now that I feel like I can do an adequate job when I'm in the ER, I'm like, how do I actually connect with patients again and actually make them feel understood? Like, even if it's not a psychiatric emergency, like all these patients just want to be fully understood. They want to feel like you actually care about them. They want to feel like you care what they're there for. And they don't really give a shit about great evidence-based medicine. They don't care about that at all. They don't care if you find the emergent diagnosis They don't care if you rule out all the bad stuff and they're safe to go home. That's not what, not, that is not what's important to them. They care that you actually listen to their story. They care that you understood them. And so I'm trying to focus on that more. And it's kind of what you guys are talking about, like 
de-escalating a patient, making them feel reassured, making them feel understood. And that's a really hard thing to do. And a lot of people really suck at it. I was going to say, I don't think that's even something you can teach interpersonal yeah. communication skills. Some people yeah. have it. Mm -hmm. some, some people, people don't. I think and you I think can develop it. Though. You can develop it. But I also feel that, like even as a newer provider, um, like me, I've always been somebody that just kind of talks and talks and talks. But you get those people that are just like, I I can't do anything for this person. Like, what do you mean talk? Like it's not, you know, they don't have enough confidence even in their own skills to even just bring somebody down that it's definitely sometimes difficult to be like, just go talk to them. Yeah. I don't know how many times I tell like new EMTs in the back of the ambulance. Talk. I'm like, they're a person. Yeah. Right. They have, they speak English. They, you can talk with them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, you got any dogs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> like, anything. Oh, right? Like anything. You know, you know, I'm like, oh, I saw that Chad, you know, tell me about your kids. I saw all the pictures around the house. You know, tell me something different. Even if it's just getting them off the situation that's going on at that point in time. It's anything too, you know, whether or not it's a psychiatric issue or something else, just talk with them. You mm -hmm. know, people are people. And I think just that's how you kind of cultivate that ability to kind of speak with people. Cause then when you get into that situation where you're like, Oh man, I'm going to have to talk to this person for an hour, yeah, you know, and then you're just sitting here talking about anything off the wall. You're yeah, looking yeah. around, like trying to grab for anything. You're like, what am yeah. I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that human connection really helps you avoid burnout because at the end of the day, if you have a bad patient interaction, you, end up escalating them instead of de-escalating them. You end up in a shouting match with them and they're like, fuck you, get out of the room or whatever like that. That'll burn you up for days on end versus if you can actually like communicate with this person and de-escalate them and make them feel reassured, make them feel understood. That actually makes you feel good for, you know, a long period of time. And so yeah. I think avoiding that horrible patient interaction will really help you avoid burnout because I mean, that, those situations really burn you out, whether you're in the right or the wrong. Because usually I'm in the right. Like, you're safe to go home. I'm not going to argue with you about it for an hour. One talking motherfucker but, over here. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but really, like, you know, we did a great job with the medicine. Like, we ruled out absolutely everything. You're safe to go home. But if I'm in a shouting match with the patient over it, I've lost, right? And I'm going to be burned out for days. <laughs> yeah. If where Versus if I can use some therapeutic communication, sit down at the bedside, like, thoroughly explain everything, answer all their questions in an unrushed manner, like that goes so much further than just being like, you're good. Get out. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hard sometimes when we're super busy. It's hard. Like I am not an extroverted person. Like sitting down and talking to the patient for an hour to me sounds horrible. <laughs> that is not what I want to do. But it also makes me feel great about my job when I actually take that time to do it. So I'm trying to be more intentional every day about yes. actually sitting down. <laughs> and that's why I use these wheelie computers that we have, because I can sit down, I bring in my computer, I can show them all the results. I can sit down next to the bed <laughs> with them and actually talk with them instead of being like, what's going on outside of the room. I've been in here for five minutes. This is way too long. <laughs> we got five ambulances that came in while I've been in this room. <laughs> well, that's a side that the patient one doesn't care about but also they don't realize that yeah like and so it's hard as you know a provider in the hospital to really be able to balance those things yeah. because it's supposed to be like patient focused but it's not at yeah. all patient focused like you have to do so many different things for so many different people and all the while making that person feel like they are the only one in the emergency room. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. It's very hard. That's really tough. <laughs> well, I, I feel like a lot of our job, not so much on the EMS side, because you can focus on one patient at a time, which is a super valuable part about EMS is you don't have to balance all these other patients. But in the ER, because we're balancing so many, I see our job as trying to sort through everybody that's safe that can go home as quickly as possible to find the ones that are dying and spend the time on those ones. Cause those are the ones that really need our help. They need our skills. They need the meds. They need a procedure, whatever. But you also want to feel, you also want to like make connections with people. And so it's, it is such a hard thing to find that balance. And I still struggle with that every shift. I try to actually fight to be in the room for long enough to make them feel understood, but also take care of the 16 other people that I have simultaneously in various stages of work up and various stages of dying. You know, it's tough. For I sure. think you just need to smile more. <laughs> there you go. There's a smile. You just walk in. So you have cancer, but hey, <laughs> your hair looks wonderful today. I kind of want to go back to the alcohol thing a little bit and just ask what advice you guys would have 
that you would give either yourself five, 10 years ago or give a paramedic or EMT that's struggling with the same thing? Because I think that's it's such a huge struggle for so many people. I don't want to graze over it too much. The hardest thing is literally admitting you have a problem. And like the stating you have a problem also is another like a taboo thing, right? But like, even like just sitting here, like, you know, listening, like, oh, I had a bad call. I want to drink. I have a bad call. I want to smoke. That's what a craving is. Like, that's what that is. And if you're getting to that point that cravings are now more and more, you got a problem. I mean, that's just reality of the fact, you know? So like, like I was saying with that acronym before, like HALT, it just made me, it makes me sound like a tool. (laughs) But like, again, like hungry, angry, and angry is like a primary and there's a whole bunch of secondary emotions, lonely and tired. Like a lot of with EMS stuff and, you know, medical can be easily in those angry emotions and the tired emotions. And you're like, fuck, I just want to go home and drink because it makes me feel good. So like if you, after a call or you get home and you feel like that, try to think, why do you want to drink? You know, because all that's going to do is compound itself. And then, you know, your mood's going to start to change. You might show up late for work um, and then you get fired and then you drink more. Um, So, I mean... From me, I try to stay away from it the best you can, you know, because like I said, it's just going to come out itself. That's, that's all it's going to do. I think for me, I think one of the biggest things that probably could have been said and maybe got me in sooner to looking at like, I knew everybody around me kind of knew I had a problem before I admitted I had a problem. Yeah. Um, and people would say things and it would just be like, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, no, I'm good. I'm huh? good. Yeah. Um, so I think listening to people when it kind of comes to those things, cause other outside people will kind of see that change on you versus way before, like you're going to even admit it. Mm-hmm. But then I think one of the biggest things that I kind of, I even tell patients like, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to be like this. Like, it's okay to not be okay. As if a lot of people say, but, um, don't be ashamed of, of, what you have, yeah. you know, being an alcoholic or having substance issues, it doesn't make you any different than a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people that suffer with it. Um, I mean, across the board, everywhere, you know, anything, any job, you know, EMS, yeah. police officers, yeah. firefighters, judges, you know, lawyers, yeah. there's so many people have this issue and you're not alone. And I mean, in the depths of it, you feel like that's the only thing that is, but it's okay. Like, it's okay to to not be okay and it's okay to to have this falter but i always say like the judgment of who you are is how you pick yourself back up right um and i've stumbled there's been multiple times you know like i said my first time was when i was 22 years old as i went to a 30 day rehab and i'm 36 now and i can say that i did not stay clean and sober for <laughs> you yeah. know 11 years um i'm going to fail and it's and it's okay to fail as well like it's okay to to, to have that because you know well you went five years man like you did really well and then of course you know your wife leaves you or something like that and that's the only thing that you remember when when hard stuff hits because you don't always get these hard things like man grandma dies dad dies brother dies like one after another yeah. you know there's sometimes like some in between time so then you get those periods of sobriety and then something bad hits and you're feeling like man i'm on cloud nine right now and i'm doing great so then you kind of start delving from that path of what was helping you to stay that great and then all of a sudden something real bad happens your wife leaves and then you're just like we're back to the bottle because one of your systems that you use like a spouse they dip out and then you're like well she's not there to regulate me no more i'm just gonna start drinking again so i mean It's okay. You know, don't be, you know, ashamed of yourself. Get the help. Don't be afraid to ask for the help too. I think that was always one of the biggest things of being like, when I was younger, I was like, I'm 23 years old and I can't. But then when I looked back at it, I started realizing like, I've had a problem with alcohol for years, years. And one of the things that's kind of helped me now, um, outlets, finding a good outlet, um, whatever that is, you know, I go tend to my chickens in my backyard, (laughs) you know, um, find something to get your mind away. Cause when, when, when those issues happen, you have to find something to, to feed your brain Mm -hmm. with that, you know? Yeah. They they call it distractions. Yeah. Whenever those, whenever that happens or cravings kick in. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, 
your distraction used to be alcohol, yeah. right? Because it distracted whatever was going on in your brain. So I, I used to putting alcohol. Well, now I need to put in a different, you know, I mm-hmm. need a different input, whether or not that's sitting down playing video games or, you know, writing or, or other things like that. Just find some other healthier outlet, you know, working out or going on bike rides, you know. It's a lot of physical activity you're saying there, but <laughs> what? what's all- fit? Physical, physical, physical. cardio. 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 I think that's one of the bigger things. Like for me, was just knowing that I wasn't alone in a lot of this. Um, So that always helps me. Like keeps me going to try and stay sober. But you know, I'm always sitting in the back of my head trying to figure out when that next thing is going to be. Yeah. You know which is kind of crappy, but I guess trying to prepare for it. Yeah. Cause I mean, there's going to be something that's next, right? I mean, there's always going to be, you're going to have a really shitty day at work. I mean, there's always going to be something on the horizon you got to be prepared for. I feel like, so you just got to expect it and prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Strengthen those, those things that make me happy now with these small little things so that when that next big one kind of comes, like I'm ready to, kind of face it appropriately and properly without the dependence upon alcohol to get me through Mm -hmm. um this definitely you know because that's the thing is you have to those are your challenges and when it challenges you have these small little challenges along the way and you just got to be able to see those small little challenges and be like okay you know it wasn't like i was late for work and you know i felt shitty all day and yada 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 i'm gonna go home and drink and you know, make yourself feel good about at least making it through and, you know, finding those little wins and everything. So, yeah. Everything you hear today from myself and my guests is opinion only. It does not represent any organizations or companies that any of us are affiliated with. The stories you hear have been modified to protect patient privacy and any resemblance to real individuals is coincidental only. This is for educational and entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice nor used to diagnose any medical or health care conditions. Kind of along those same lines, like what other what other coping strategies do you guys have kind of in our field that you use to overcome burnout and avoid burnout? And like, what are some of the healthy strategies you guys use after a tough day? I know I said this last time, but I do like cardio. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I work out a lot. (laughs) I try to work out a lot. Like sometimes you have your moments where you're just too busy. That is a thing. (laughs) That's my excuse every time. um, Yeah. (laughs) Um, and then my kids have very busy lives as well. So that helps me, um, be distracted. They are a distraction, Mm -hmm. I guess. So, but yeah, I just try to like have positive outlets, I guess, um, to keep me away from the negative ones. Cause like I said before, I, I think anybody is susceptible to negative, um, distractions. (laughs) Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I do. But I think that for me, since I've been very young, um, working out has always given my brain like a release and makes me feel really good. So Mm. ever since I was a kid, I've just always done that. So it's like second nature to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like really bad when I don't work out. Yeah, It's like, I feel bad. (laughs) Why are you so mean, Sarah? Oh, I should probably like go work out and I will be a lot nicer. (laughs) It's like that and making sure that I'm fed. (laughs) That's all you need. (laughs) So, but that's like the biggest thing. And then just like other activities, like, you know, like, I don't know if you write, but I don't really write, but um, I tell my kids when they're stressed out to write or like draw or paint or like do something creative because your mind is always working. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I think writing is a really good one that we haven't really touched on before because some of the questions I'll answer from EMTs and paramedics is they're like rolling through their mind, like on this endless loop, a horrible call that they ran, like it's running through their mind all the time, like always in the background. And they want to know how to like quit this horrible loop and dwelling on the situation. And I think like writing the whole situation down, whether it's typing or just handwriting exactly what happened, how you felt about it, why you're struggling with it, why you're still thinking about it, and then just ripping it up and throwing it away can be really helpful to actually like process through absolutely every part of the situation, know that you fully thought about it, and then just try to move on. Like, because there's a lot of burdens that we're asked to carry every day that we just need to be able to put down. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. And I think that 
like actually physically writing, not typing, mm-hmm. is different. Yeah, totally. Like I feel like if you actually write it down and then you can just take that piece of paper and like light it on fire mm-hmm. safely, um, <laughs> light it on fire <laughs> or throw it away or rip it up or whatever, that alone would give you like more peace than just like yeah. typing it. Well, it's like a physical, typing. it's a physical action that actually will, you know, be kind of therapeutic, I think, and help your brain move past the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing that uh, someone brought up to me when I first was going into this job, they like, make sure you maintain like a social group outside of EMS. And that's was really hard for me to do at first because you spend so much time with these people. Mm-hmm. But it has become like my grounding point because it's, you know, a group that will remind me that there's other stuff going on. And so it helps me from being burnt out. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We can go do this. Or it's like, we'll make plans a few weeks out. And like, that's a goal or something that I have to look forward to, or I hate working out, but I will set a goal for myself and I'm like, okay. And so having stuff like that, so you don't get lost in the day to day or hold on to like a, a patient that just ruined your day or a call that ruined your day that having stuff to like, okay, well next week me and my friend are going to go do this. And that's going to have nothing to do with work. Absolutely nothing to do with work and a, a safe place. Like my daughter is that for me too. Sometimes to shut your brain off to it helps as long as you can actually utilize it for that moment. If you sit there and you just dwell in it the whole time, then you're miserable and then you lost a day and it sucks. So having friends outside of what I do for work helps immensely to me most of the time and then they don't know they don't want to know what i do and they don't ask me questions so we just talk about literally anything else yeah it's nice to not talk about medicine with oh, friends sometimes yes. i also think that's good because well i feel like you should have friends in both places because you need to have like that outlet for from people that understand like what you're doing but then you also need to have that outlet so that you kind of put yourself in check because you know we have dark humor in ems and like we say some crazy things and other people are like wrong group of friends Uh, (laughs) oh sorry you need to put that back in the box (laughs) even other specialties like in pa school (laughs) nobody got my humor it was far too dark i had to like shut it down pretty early on because People would just look at me very bewildered. They would not think it was funny at That's, all. Oh, it was <laughs> and like, I'd be like, it's death, you guys. It's hilarious. And they're like, what? <laughs> when I was in my Wrong pediatric job. office, I told them I got the job in the in an ER. And they're like, we think that's going to suit you better. I was like, oh, all right. Well, I'm going to feel the same way. I don't belong here. So they did not appreciate my humor. Any best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, not with pediatric no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a coping strategy for sure, the the dark humor that we have. But I don't think it's a bad one. I mean, I think mm-hmm. making light of situations is just kind of how we get through them sometimes. At least know? in that moment. Yeah. You know, I think uh, moving forward, it, it helps us cope with it. But then in that moment, but then you have those ones that you're just like, no. <laughs> yes. You might need to go see somebody for a minute. <laughs> there's, a, there's a line, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. maybe you're even a little yeah. past that line. Yeah. I mean, but definitely in that moment of, you know, coming back from the call and just joking with your partner, you know, heading back to the station about something of of trying to just, you know, bring yourself just down. So your dark humor is just like, Mm -hmm. and then it's like, okay, now it's time to process it. Let's just figure this out. But definitely when we all get together, it can be, it can be pretty bad. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> because i mean like well i'm not on the rig anymore obviously but you know we can't go home after those calls right we have to get right back in the rig and do it all over again mm-hmm. you know i mean i'm sure i mean i've ran you know arrests in doctor's offices where their employees are bawling their eyes out or you know someone's bawling their eyes out obviously so it's like well yeah and then we're, we're like right, we there's did, your trash can yeah like we did our best <laughs> and now we gotta get back <laughs> in the rig we gotta get back in the rig and do it all over again yeah yes. you know so like when like i've had fun debates with people about dark humor they're like oh that's a horrible coping mechanism and i'm like no it's not because i literally just like you said like at the time like this is going on and we can't just go home yeah. like we have to get back in the rig or you know back in the pa like the recess and, room and you have to be healthy 
and competent to work on that next patient just as, just as well as good, yep. and, and as good as you did with the patient that you, you know, that yeah. you just called in the middle of the doctor's office. You know, yeah. I don't get that time to be like, oh, you know, that was. That was I can't take good. a lunch break. Yeah. Like, you know, you know yeah. that I have to be just I have to be at 100 percent, even if I run a pediatric arrest mm-hmm. before that. 45 minutes after that, you know, and I might be running another one. Yeah. You know, and you don't know what's being thrown at you. So being able to kind of cope and, and throw that dark humor in there to put it in reserve, right. To, yeah. to be like, I'm going to have to deal with this a little bit later, of course, you know, but if you, like you said, we don't get that ability to just go home. Oh, I need my time. I need I my think, time. I think that's a great point. Like you're, you've got to put it on the back burner and that's kind of how we do it because you have to be ready to go take care of that next patient, yeah. you know, like, mm-hmm. and, and there's always another 100%. patient and they're coming in the next five minutes, probably. Yeah. So you don't have time to spend a half hour debriefing. Like in an ideal world, it'd be great if we could spend a half hour, all sit down in a circle and sing Kumbaya and <laughs> debrief a no. horrible call. That we're, would be, that would be perfect. We're hauling all ass down the world, street, listening yeah, to we some have calls freaking, holding. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slipknot heading to the next freaking call, <laughs> just caffeined up, nicotine yeah. out, and just trying to figure it out for the yeah. next call. And like, like you have to give that a hundred percent. It's not like I, I feel so bad walking in sometimes, but I'm just not there. And if, you know, it's like, why am I not there? Well, because the last call. Like, what if you're stepping into that same exact scenario? Yeah, you know, you might be able to. You may have lost a patient before, but then you're walking almost to the exact same scenario. And now you have a second chance to to not screw up or to do it right or whatever. You know, and you can't really think about that last one. You know, yeah. but like you'll you're here and you'll be walking on in, but like, all right, let's not kill this one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody's like. What do you say? What do you say? <laughs> no, no. Yeah. And then like, you know, if it's not on the back burner, kind of like you were saying, I mean, that can cloud judgment, you know, all those emotions and stuff can be ramping you up. You become tunnel vision. You don't think of the whole ages and T's or even like something as simple as, you know, your focus. And then you're not, you didn't see that daughter's the one that just stabbed your dad. And she's sitting there like, play with me. And you're like, no, <laughs> some Annabelle shit. <laughs> I'm good. Or you have those days that, Everybody dies. Like, I mean, I'm sure you guys have had it. Reaper days, everyone dies, no matter what you do. 12 hour shift, all cardiac arrest, where, and they're all Where dead. you've seen more dead people than alive people. In the <laughs> yeah, we've seen more dead people than alive people. Yeah. And you're like, everyone's dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like and guess what? You gotta go home, come I back see to. Dead people. I see dead people. <laughs> twitched. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking of this because you guys are talking about all the. <laughs> dead people and I mean, it sort of applies but go not. on have you ever have you ever ran a call like a cardiac arrest and then immediately after that delivered a baby because i have. we're about to get some spiritual shit ain't we what? No, not really. <laughs> but it was just really yeah let's hear some it details wasn't fun. i know but we got not from so, the same person i hope it, no <laughs> <laughs> it was like really sad um this like i think he was only like 10 or 12 but he called because his grandma was not moving. Mm-hmm. Like, and um, I was pretty new paramedic at the time. Um, and so um, she was a DOA. Yeah. And I was just like, who is going to take care of this baby? Like, didn't have parents. Like, grandma was guardian. So I'm super worried about this kid. So anyways, PD matter, right? Yeah. So we left. And then literally we were driving away from the house and got dispatched to an oh imminent birth. <laughs> so of course, the other guys bringing this lady down three flights of stairs, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> baby number three. But we got to deliver in the back of the ambulance, and that was really cool. Huh? And Sorry. I was like, I really needed that today. Like yeah. that was really sad. I felt so terrible for this little boy who no longer had a guardian. And then we got to bring a new baby girl in the world, and yeah. so I feel like. Sometimes, I don't know, spiritual, not spiritual, I don't know. Sometimes you just draw the right card and then that helps you get over the bad stuff too. Mm-hmm. Some reincarnation so yeah. shit. <laughs> that was Which grandma. Was yeah. was, uh, <laughs> you get to you get to sit there and, and see both sides of it. You know? yeah. That's uh, that's one thing I love about this job though, is like you can you can see the entire gamut of you know life, death, even just like everything and everything in between one day yeah yeah you know and it's like even just the people that you meet and come across and you're just like 
man, this is amazing, you know? Mm-hmm. And like the just like having a nice conversation with an old person in the back of the I ambulance. Love that. That's like my favorite call. <laughs> I mean, I really like doing like when I can actually use my skills and yeah. like really get into it. But next to that, I just love having a nice conversation <laughs> with an old person Bessie, <laughs> yes because they have so much insight into life true and it just makes you appreciate like well insight from like the 1940s kind of <laughs> it doesn't matter they're just like they're usually so cute sometimes they're like they can be whiny like it's not a hundred percent all the time like wonderful yeah. but most of the time when you find that right one, they just fill your cup up and it's so fun. I like the ones that try to like hit on you. Like it's uh, always like 70, 80 year old, 90 year old females. And she's like, I can pull these dentures out of them. No, put you put those dentures back in. She, she'll sit there and like touch my leg. Honey, if I was just 20 years younger, I didn't know you're not. Like shoot, if I was shoot 20 shot. years older. Yeah. 20 years younger. Nope. Like I get it. Like, shoot your shot. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just don't care. <laughs> or you're like, I got to put any kids you on. You're like, all right. And they're like, honey, I bought these. I'm like, good for you, girl. <laughs> That's why they didn't fall down. That's why they didn't fall down. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh. <laughs> I love those ones. They're always better. <laughs> Admire them. I paid a lot of money for these. I paid a lot of money for these, yep. <laughs> for that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the cute, like, probably the cute, right, let's guess that. The cutest one is, this is me, my first partner, you know, big. We walk in and she's just on the floor. She's like, I have fallen and I can't get up. And we're just, oh, honey. She's like, is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> we're like, honey. That's cute. That's so sweet. Back up. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any like specific stories they want to tell before we kind of go on to other topics? Does anybody have like any impactful patient experiences or anything they came wanting to share? Yeah, subject. <laughs> no. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sound like my therapist right now. Maybe you pick. What do you want? Right. It's not what I asked. <laughs> um, we, I, we can go on to the next subject, but if anybody has anything that they wanted to share, it doesn't have to be related. Mm. Not, I mean, anything yeah. impactful or like the story that like you were like, ah, I can keep doing this job another week. Uh, I mean, mainly mine are more what you guys call psychiatric stuff. It's weird to me, a word. But like, um, so this was me and Big, and then at the park downtown ish ish. Um, so a mom called because her son ran away. So you know, PD finds his son. You go to the son. So he's like, I think he's sixteen. He was with two girls and one of his buddies. So he's kind of like on that brink of choking up. You can kind of hear like in his throat. It's kind of scratchy. Um, Alex, are you good? I just, no, no, I just, just see looking. ADHD's good. Enough. Shiny, oh, yeah. <laughs> shiny. But yeah, so <laughs> like, so he's sitting there talking to us, and then um, we get him in the back because he wanted to talk privately. So he was actually there. Um, he was pretty much prostituting himself, like for the girls and the guy to get heroin. And like, he literally just looked at me. He's like, I just need. Like, he just started bawling, and he's asked me to hold him. And I sat there and I cried with this kid. Like, I was just holding him. And then I told him, I was like, dude, like, I kind of, I understand that. Like, I, mine wasn't heroin, mine was pills, but I was like, I get it. So, like, we took him to the hospital. Um, and then, like, whenever me and Big were walking out, he literally just looked at me, cried, and just said thanks. And then I just bawled. And then I was like, this is kind of why I joined medicine. Because I didn't have anyone tell me that, you know. So, like, hopefully he's okay. But, like, I didn't have anyone tell me that. I got looked at differently, you know. So those are the calls that I makes me want to stay. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's pretty much that. Shiny. I, don't know, I think, I think a, for me, a lot of my calls, I just don't even realize like it was so impactful until kind of like afterwards where I was like, they're like, oh, they survived. And I'm like, okay, this is why, this is why I do it. So I don't really remember the calls until like later on when they're like, oh, you know that person that you brought in that was really messed up? Well, they survived. And you're like, what? Like, oh, okay, cool, sweet. I did something right. Yes. So, I think kind of, kind of like a lower degree of a neat story. I had one patient who had just got diagnosed with a PE, and so they put her on blood thinners, and she was just, I, I wouldn't say hypochondriac, but had some serious like medical anxiety going on. 
and I was doing her IV and she was absolutely convinced the IV was going to cause her to bleed out. Bleed out. <laughs> and then I, you know, I also had that same, that was a lot big reason why I went to medicine is because I was a huge hypochondriac. And so I was like, if I know exactly what's going to happen, if I'm dying, I can at least prevent it. And then I just fell in love with medicine. Um, so I was explaining to her why she's not going to bleed out from the IV. And then she was convinced the IV was going to give her another, uh, like air got into her IV. And I was like, this is what the science behind why the vacuum container won't allow that and why this. And I was in probably intake three for 45 minutes. Like my flow is knocking on the door, like what to do and what to do and what to do. And <laughs> And then we leave and I get her in her room and then she's leaving and she's like, thank you so much for doing that. And like that, that patient, that's like, you really made that so much better for me. And her husband was like, she was off the walls until you talked to her. Mm. That's the stuff that like, mm. lets me go home at the end of the day. I'm like, okay, I like my job. I like my job. And I did something I was supposed to do today. That's the kind of stuff that will stick with me more than like the, the super gnarly stuff is like the adrenaline rush. The stuff that helps mm. me go to sleep at night is like the somewhat like the person appreciative of the time that you spend with them is that's the part that helped me fall asleep. Yeah, I think that's huge because it is about those like smaller patient moments where like they're not dying or anything like that. But if you can actually spend some time to reassure them, like it makes it builds you up too. like you made that patient feel a lot better, but it also makes you be able to do this job again the next day. Like I think that is huge. and People don't realize that, mm-hmm. that it, it is about kind of these small moments and the easy things like because that's that doesn't require like a high level skill or anything like that, but it just required a little bit of time, a little bit of patience with them and some explanation and we're all better off for it. If you guys got any value out of this today, if it resonated with you, encouraged you, the only thing I ask is you subscribe to the show, give a star, five star rating and review, which will help a ton. I don't make any money on the podcast and it does cost money to do it. So if you want to support the show, go to practicalems.com, join the email list and subscribe on any podcast player on YouTube as well under Practical EMS. And we will see you guys next time.